This is the Insight is Capital podcast. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual podcasters and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of advisoranalyst.com. This podcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this podcast is intended to be considered as advice. Hello and welcome to the Insight is Capital podcast. My name is Pierre Daly, Managing Editor of AdvisorAnalyst.com. Our guest is Sandy Liang, President of Purpose Investment Partners. Purpose Investments manages over $8 billion in assets. And Sandy is Portfolio Manager of the Purpose Credit Opportunities Fund, as well as a number of other mandates at the firm. Sandy has over 27 years of credit investment experience, including 17 years on Wall Street, with Cobalt Capital Partners and was a senior managing director at Bear Stearns. He was also named to Institutional Investor Magazine's All-America Fixed Income Team for seven consecutive years. Sandy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Pierre. I think it might frame our conversation about the extraordinary high-speed COVID-19 crash in markets that we've just experienced in the last month if we talk a little bit about your background, your story on Wall Street, your learnings from the 0809 global financial crisis. Sure, I, I can address that, Pierre. Uh, I've been in business for, uh, now it's almost almost 30 years. Uh, started in 1991 uh, in Toronto and in equities research. And through my career, I, I've seen a number of cycles and a number of uh, bubbles um, in Toronto, we had the 1996 junior mining bubble. Uh, we had the tech wreck in, in 1999, 2000. Uh, sorry, I forgot the long-term capital uh, Asian crisis in 1998. Then the tech wreck. Uh, then the, the credit crisis. Um, so, you know, obviously there's business cycles. There's been a number of business cycles in my career, and um, you know this this one's unique because. Uh, it is going to be where we are in the middle of a recession. That is pretty clear. I think the recession started very abruptly. Um, and securities prices have reflected that. You, usually going into a recession, securities prices kind of adjust slowly. Uh, people see activity slowing. Um, they're changing their earnings forecasts. And, uh, and that results in, in a, a step function in securities prices lower, whereas this time, uh, the recession started very abruptly, and all of a sudden, uh, all estimates are off. No forward estimates are good. Uh, people are staring into the void in terms of lower earnings for companies in a number of industries, and um, prices adjusted rapidly, and therefore, we had the uh, sharpest or quickest bear market in the history of S&P 500. Yeah, it certainly did happen very quickly, and uh, you know, most people would agree that they were mostly unprepared for, for the, uh, the swift reaction, although... We did have a little bit of a lead up in February with the news breaking out of China. Once the pandemic spread uh, to Europe and then to North America, things changed obviously very quickly. Um, from your vantage point, Sandy, what are the differences and what are the similarities between today's COVID-19 crisis versus the 0809 crisis? Um, well, you know what, before I answer that, uh, I just want to address something you mentioned with, with the speed of this crisis, because it is true that... Um, people were caught flat-footed. And, and frankly, uh, I think that a lot of professional money managers such as myself thought they were uh, positioned very defensively. I mean, we were positioned defensively in that um, in our credit fund, we had a 40% cash position going to the crisis spot, which by any standard uh, is defensive, especially when there's other ways in an absolute return fund. Um, you can kind of make yourself less volatile. But the reality is, because of the speed of the bear market, uh, you know, any long position was not a good position to have. And, and I would, uh, as as an aside, um, you know, I, I, a lot of the crisis, the speed of it, I personally attribute to statistics coming out of China, where in January and the month of February, um, there was a lot of brokers, brokerage research. There was a, there were economists. Uh, in Asia, there were published figures that showed that infection rates actually coming down through February. And um, it, it's very hard in this business where if everyone's seeing the same numbers, it's hard not to have the group think because um, it appeared in February that the virus was being relatively successfully contained, and that's why the S&P 500 hit its all-time high on February 19th. 
one of the reasons why this bear market was very swift, in, in my opinion, is because as an investment professional, um, the whole world knew about the virus in late January and through February. And I think that the reason that investors were caught flat-footed was because there were some widely published statistics that brokerage houses were publishing in their research through the month of February that indicated that the infection rates in China were actually declining. So there were new inf in infections, but it was declining. Um, so uh, the second derivative was, was negative. And so therefore, everyone uh, watching these stats said, well, you know, we see the numbers and it looks like this thing seems contained um, and therefore China's slower. We're going to have low interest rates for a long time, but um, it's contained. And therefore, uh, you know, that's the reason that the S&P 500 hit its all-time high on February 19th, which was really not that long ago. But there was a total miscommunication. I mean, miscommunication is, is I don't know, is that the right word for... Uh, <laughs> Misinformation. Yeah, a miss, a miss something. Yeah, and you know the, the Chinese government doesn't have my home address, so I can just say lying, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to know whether or not to trust Chinese authorities. No, it, it's definitely not. I mean, there's been some um, widely published intelligence that, that's come out that's shown that shipments of urns for uh, morgues is roughly 12 times what the reported deaths have been in the Wuhan area. So that's the kind of discrepancies that uh, uh, that we've seen. So the point is that... Uh, I, I, I hadn't heard that. That's that's uh, that's remarkable. Yeah, yeah. And that's not a stat. That's, uh, I, I guess, I mean, it is kind of a stat. It is anecdotal. But uh, the point is that um, everyone was watching the stats and the S&P kind of shrugged it off, shrugged it off because, uh, you know, we were, North America was kind of in a little bit of an economic upswing and, well, okay, if growth is going to moderate a little bit, but interest rates are going to stay low for a long time, then that's not a bad situation. So that's, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we hit an all-time high in the S&P 500 on February 19th. But uh, the week immediately after that is when the wheels start to come off for two reasons. Number one, uh, China changed the measurement method for new infections, and number two, um, it spread beyond China, and then ever since then, we've been in this uh, bear market. So uh, back to what we were uh, discussing, where uh, we have been defensively positioned going into it, but 40% uh, cash seems like a, a lot of cash, but um, in a market like that, I mean, if you're long $1, then you're, you know, you're long too much, right? I think most people would agree that 40% cash was very defensive. Personally, I think it's commendable. If you were fully invested going into this thing at the stage we were at, that might be a little more damning. I don't think that would go to your favor going into this downturn. The fact that you were already taking a fairly defensive posture at 40% cash, I think that would be something that, that most investors and most advisors would look at and say, uh, wow, that's actually a feather in your cap, Sandy. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and I mean, to be fair, um, we are not market timers. We do not try to pretend that we can create alpha um, knowing when to be in and out of the market. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time talking about, you know, how do you feel about the market here? Really, uh, our cash balance is a function of idea flow. And, and I think that, you know, now it's early April and the uh, number of potential ideas on the radar screen is much, much larger, uh, the number of ideas than there were in February, and that explains why in February we had um, such a large cash balance. So, um, uh, Sandy, from your vantage point, from your from your experience and from where you sit, what are, what are the differences? Like, I know it might be a little soon, but what are the differences and similarities between, between the... 0809 crisis that you experienced firsthand and today's COVID-19 crisis? First and foremost, uh, 2020 COVID-19, this is more of a natural disaster than an economic event. I mean, basically, this virus has washed a tsunami uh, over the landscape where, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter whether your house is close to the beach or whether you're 10 blocks in because 
everyone's been hit by this tsunami. And as a result, uh, the reaction function from governments and central banks has been very swift, very decisive, and um, very large. And that is very different than in 2008 where, well, Bear Stearns went out of business. Well, actually, sorry, I worked at Bear Stearns. We did not go to business. We got bought by J.P. Morgan in March 2008. Uh, and then uh, another six months passed before Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And at the time, the Fed could have saved Lehman. And uh, there's a lot of deliberation just basically said, you know what, buyer beware, or actually that's not the right phrase, but uh, um, Lehman went bankrupt and the Fed allowed it because uh, you, know, you can't save every company that's going to go bankrupt. And Lehman kind of uh, should have known, especially after Bear had issues in March, that they should have deleveraged. And, and the point is that in 2020 COVID-19 crisis, there's no bad guys. This is a natural disaster. Uh, and in 2008, uh, Wall Street greed was definitely the bad guy. Wall Street greed and leverage and um, um, risk taking. And there was just, uh, a, there were a lot of reasons why the governments and central banks were reluctant to step in decisively in 2008. So I think that's one major difference where, uh, you know, the conclusion is the amount of um, government largesse to support this crisis is off the charts. I mean, you know, the U.S. very quickly committed $2 trillion, including $1,200 per adult of helicopter money, i.e. they're sending checks. Um, they approved that very quickly in a bi bipartisan fashion. Uh, and, and that is not what really went down in 2008. So, um, No, yeah, I mean, there was a very, there was obviously, there was a very long delay in 2008. Uh, to get to get any kind of package or deal approved um, this time around there was only a, about a two or three day yeah and, and I, I think as a result of that decisiveness not necessarily just on the government side but also the central banks um, the in, even though everything's traded down it hasn't really other than I would say a couple days in March it hasn't really been disordered where it, it really is you know it's more of a two-way market uh, you can get things done mostly at a price uh, you might you may not like the price, but the point is that um, there is a two-way market. There is a little bit more liquidity than in 2008, where when 2008 uh, in 2008 Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, they had a prime broker, which meant that if you're a hedge fund, you may have kept all your accounts at Lehman. And if you had a if you had Lehman as one of your prime brokers, all those assets were frozen, uh, and not only could you not access those assets, but everyone else you borrowed money from was asking for their money back at the same time. And, and that created a scale of selling in a way that was off the charts, whereas this one is a little more orderly, but I think that the economic impact of the COVID-19 um, uh, you know, is going to be uh, a lot, it's going to be worse than what it was in 2008, but uh, on the other hand, the markets are a lot more orderly. The, sorry, the, the, whole, the whole banking system was in jeopardy in 2008. That's not the case today. No, and, and not only that, it, it's... The Fed, U.S. government, uh, even in Canada, um, they're not going to allow widespread bankruptcies. Uh, it's pretty clear that they will do whatever it takes to make sure that there is liquidity in, in that this is not this one. And do you, do you think, uh, speaking of, of uh, intervention, do you foresee any further intervention at this point? I think that, uh, as I said, uh, they're going to do what it takes, and, and they're going to. Uh, there's a lot of dry powder, and, and frankly, uh, because inflation has been nowhere, and uh, inflation discounted by financial markets has gone to basically nowhere, uh, and oil prices are down, you know, way, way down. Gasoline prices are down. Um, there is a blank check that can, you know, basically the, the U.S. government. Canadian government, everyone has a blank check to throw whatever they need to at this problem. Yeah, what what have been the what have been the biggest dislocations in credit markets? There's been a lot of different uh, areas that we've looked at, but um, dislocation in terms of what may not reflect reality, uh, our number one, I guess, uh, our number one poster child for that 
right now is, is we think the real estate sector because, um, as you know, REITs generally as stocks, REITs own packages of real estate and they normally reflect what's going on in the private market in terms of value. You can't really, um, you know, there's no free lunch. If you buy a company full of uh, office buildings or warehouses, it generally reflects private market value. Uh, what we've seen south of the border is that REITs have gone from trading at NAV to a 50% discount to NAV, sometimes 60. And in Canada, it's been 30 or 40, sometimes 50 or 60. The point is that it's only been a month and a half, and, and I don't think that uh, uh, the, the real estate market has gone down 50% in a month just because there's going to be a few months of missed rent checks and, uh, you know, bad debt a little bit higher, um, especially because interest rates have done nothing but go down, and everyone knows that the value of real estate is very correlated with interest rates. So uh, I would say, yeah, uh, number one dislocation is the real estate sector. So, you know, we're, we're pretty involved in some, some equities. We're pretty involved in some bonds. Um, on the real estate side. Some of those mortgage rates in the U.S. have had some major sort of spread blowouts, right? Yeah, and the mortgage side is, is a little bit different than the REIT side because mortgage uh, mortgage REITs are uh, levered vehicles full of mortgages, and, and if mortgages trade down, then you know maybe you have too much leverage and maybe some of those have declined for good reason. Um, I, I'm talking more about... Um, real estate uh, you know, REITs and, and just basically the value of real estate discounted by the stock market, uh, which has also made its way in some of the bonds as well. Yeah, I, and I guess what I'm asking you is that some of the uh, the Fed's intervention didn't reach certain areas areas of the credit market, of course. I mean, they they helped investment grade. They, they provided support to the high yield market. But there was an maybe uh, agency mortgage-backed securities. But beyond that, uh, the Fed's intervention didn't didn't carry. I mean, it didn't provide support to the entire credit market. There were at there were um, sleeves of different kinds of credit that were not provided with support from this intervention. Absolutely, they uh, they definitely decided to draw the line, and that doesn't mean that line in the sand is is going to be. Uh, uh, you know, it obviously could change, but I, I think that uh, uh, Nutrient comes from capital markets, so I think he, Stephen Nutrient, uh, Treasury Secretary, kind of understands markets. Um, actually, he was a client when I was at Bear Stearns uh, of the High Yield Bond Desk. Um, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, they, they drew the line on investment grade, but they also, they were pretty targeted in that they also surprisingly said, hey, we're going to buy ETFs. Uh, why? because a lot of the, um, the dislocation was reflected in the difference between ETF trading prices versus where their NAV was marked, because based on where the ETFs were trading below the NAV, um, they were indicating that prices might be a lot lower. So uh, the Fed was very targeted and, and noticed that you know, if they start buying uh, uh, some of the ETFs, then the prices would adjust appropriately and the NAV would start to equal prices again. So uh, that kind of makes sense. Well, it's also it's yeah, it's great for investors in in those ETFs. It's also, but it's also it was also the most direct route for them to take, right? In terms of getting into that market, in terms of pr providing support to that. Yeah, I mean, it, it was good for those investors in that those funds are not supposed to be that volatile. No, yeah, the volatility has been terrible, right? I mean, it, it's been we've seen the the VIX up in the uh, 80s. I don't think it's there anymore. But uh, we we saw the VIX up in the 80s as recently as last week. Yeah, the volatility's off, been off the charts, and and there's been a lot of investment strategies that are inherently short volatility that have been hurt as a result. So um, coming back to, I mean, some of those areas that were not supported by the uh, the Fed are those because of of the nature that their spreads are are more even more blown out than other than parts of the market where. There have there was Fed support. Do you see any opportunity in any of those parts of the credit market where the spreads were really blown out, where spreads have really widened? Like, uh, but do you see any opportunities in the market like that where, where, where there's an inefficiency that's arisen because of misperception of what the spreads should be versus because of the liquidity dislocation? 
Um, absolutely, Pierre. I mean, you know, we're involved in a lot of different areas of credit, and I'll, I'll give you uh, an example um, where, you know, in 2008, you saw some similar things happen um, in terms of structured credit, which are, you know, CLOs, and mortgage-backed securities, and mortgage-backed security structures, and uh, um, so we're involved in some areas of the market where uh, we're involved in CLOs in terms of not buying the underlying loans, but we buy the securities. And um, there's equity-like returns right now in CLOs, and you don't have to be taking a lot of risk. I mean, you can be in stuff that's actually A-rated by rating agencies, not that you know that's always the gold seal, but the point is that you can make equity returns in A-rated tranches of CLOs today and you know you pretty much have to see half your portfolio default at a disappointing um, recovery before you get hurt. Uh, and in by the way, in the 2008 financial crisis, um, there was actually virtually no defaults in the CLO world. So securities traded down a lot because everyone was getting margin calls. But when push came to, came to shove, and uh, there weren't a lot of um, CLO defaults because uh, normally in that market, in the bank loan market, your first lien and recoveries are quite high. So that's an example for sure. Um, but there's definitely, you know, in the asset back space where normally spreads will be, um, you know, 150, 200 basis points. I mean, a lot of stuff right now is 600, 700, 800 over. Um, so, you know, frankly, we don't do a lot of asset backs. I mean, we're mostly uh, researching companies and, and industries, but, you um, uh, you know, to your point, there's a lot of dislocation out there. There's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, I, I, the reason I asked you, Sandy, is because I know as an active manager, uh, you're you're a sniper. You're not. Uh, you don't have a shotgun approach. So you know, as a sniper, you'd be looking for opportunities where you know the quality of the fundamentals are clear to you, uh, but but there's a complete mispricing. Yeah, we. Uh, we, we try to um, uh, maximize uh, return per unit of risk, that's, that's for sure. What are some of the areas of the bond and credit market that have been hit hard that you like, that are opportunistic to you? And also, conversely, what are some of examples that you would avoid? Uh, well, we talked about real estate a little bit. Um, you know, we like, uh, on the equity side, um, we like some REITs. We... Uh, um, you know, we, we, we like some where you create. Yeah, it used to be that a normal implied cap rate, say, in New York City and Manhattan was, uh, um, you know, 4.5% prior to the crisis, uh, you know, $1,000 plus per square foot. And we can now create Manhattan at a 7.5%, 8% uh, implied cap rate. Um, we can do it at, uh, you know, $500 a square foot. I mean, it seems like the risk reward makes sense, especially we can buy security like that. That's got a dividend yield of, uh, uh, seven, eight percent. Um, we think that there's opportunities in some of the companies that lend money that are not banks because, uh, as, uh, as we talked about, banks have been, uh, beneficiaries of, uh, support over time, but non-bank lenders uh, have, are on the wrong side of the line in terms of uh, direct support from the Fed. So, um, you know, we're in a number of businesses that are involved in con consumer lending, and, and these businesses uh, lend money at higher rates of interest over time to people that, you know, don't have the 700 credit score, but on the other hand, having done it for a number of cycles, they're very, very good at it. They have a lot of data, a lot of analytics, and, you um, you know, their, their equities and debt securities uh, have uh, obviously been beaten up in the crisis because people think that, uh, uh, you know, all these loans are going bad. But it doesn't make sense when the Fed is, is or sorry, the government is, is, uh, has committed to so much support to people that are out of work, so much support to small and medium-sized businesses. They're basically carrying uh, small and medium-sized businesses for 75% of their payroll for two months. And, and that's... Uh, clearly going to make its way into, um, you know, th this crisis I don't think is as bad. It's going to be as bad as people perceive. We're definitely in a recession, but uh, I don't think this is a depression. So. Yeah, that's, there's, 
there's been a fair bit of scaremongering with the depression talk, right? I mean, it's not likely. I mean, in nineteen in nineteen in the nineteen thirties, the uh, the government did nothing. They basically said, you know, look to yourselves. They, they you know, people people were pretty much left to their own devices, and 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 you know, they expected. They actually said, you know, the wealthy should help the poor, and none of those things ever came to pass. And basically, you know, they had the long bread lines, the long food lines in in nineteen thirty three. There may be some of that happening now with food banks. There are, there is, there is a percentage of the uh, population that that you know was was uh, one or two one or two paychecks away from disaster, um, and 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 you know people people need to eat and they need to have a roof over their heads. Um, but is it going to be like the depression? I I think not. And and uh, judging by what you said, I think you agree as well. Which is that? That's a that's a really sort of you know extreme scenario that that might not apply given the amount of intervention that we're seeing. Has anything changed? I mean, given that you went into this downturn with forty percent cash and your existing holdings that you were that you were uh, keeping, obviously, um, what are some of the areas that that you see continuing on as fundamentally sound long term opportunities like? Yeah, um, we, you know, the way we've been looking at the world is, uh, uh, you know, first and foremost, if we're in an issue where we want to make sure it has liquidity to get through this crisis, and so you have to have a base case in terms of when this is disruption. And I think a reasonable base case is somewhere between, uh, uh, you know, the end of the second quarter and the end of the year, things are going to return to normal, uh, relatively normal. I mean, I'm not sure they're going to be 100% normal. So, um, you know, if we're getting paid a lot to be in something that we think has liquidity to last till the end of the year, then then I think we're getting paid well. So, um, you know, we have this, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, obviously, airlines, lodging, cruise ships, those areas have been horrible. Uh, and, and some companies that were very strong credits two months ago are not so much now. And, and so, you know, we've been involved in uh, an issuer, Golden Nugget uh, and Landry's. The name of the issuer is Golden Nugget, but it's basically uh, kind of a conglomerate that has uh, a very, you know, good-sized restaurant business with literally hundreds of outlets. Uh, it, it has casinos. It's privately owned by uh, a gentleman named Tillman Fertitta, um, who also owns the uh, Houston Rockets, and um, it's it you know they're in the high yield debt market. Uh, we are in their senior debt. They paid six and three quarter coupon, and um, you know this debt went from par value to fifty cents on the dollar. I mean that's what's happened to this piece of paper. That was very high quality. I mean, obviously par value um, in January, February, because, uh, you know, obviously the company is shut down and there, there's no casino open. Um, there's no restaurant open. They're doing takeout business only. Um, and obviously uh, no sports. Yeah. The, uh, no basketball. Um, so then the question is, well, how long can they last? And, um, uh, you know, with the bonds at 50, uh, they've actually moved back to 60, and, and we bought uh, we bought some more of those. But um, you know, the bottom line is that in a base case where uh, Tillman Fertitta puts a little bit more equity into the company, it's already defined that they do a secured debt financing that does rank ahead of where we are, but it's also backed by their online gaming business. The financing gets done. It's about to get done. And that plus um, some money from the CARE Act on the restaurant side because of the shutdown, um, if you add this all together in, in a reasonable scenario, um, they get through the end of the year. If, if we're shut down until the end of the year, they get through with no additional financing. And um, even if they need additional financing at the end of the year, uh, it's, you know, they'll probably, like, th these are hard assets that are worth real money that are not going to be, you know, th there's a reason for them to exist. 
So, you know, we think we're going to be fine. And this is the kind of stuff where we're actually in a relatively senior position, the cap structure. There's debt behind us, and we're still making 20%. Growth. So um, that's the kind of cost-benefit where, you know, we're looking at a situation that is uh, obviously not the middle of the fairway. It is in lodging. It is in restaurants. These businesses are affected. But you, you have to have a reasonable view in terms of what you think is going to happen and have the risk reward um, in your favor. But there's another great example uh, in Canada. It's, it's Air Canada. I mean, everybody knows Air Canada, right? And, and uh, Air Canada Common Equity has gone from 50 to, I guess, it bottomed at roughly $11 and is trading at $17, $18 today. Um, Air Canada's, uh, you know, got a pretty dominant position in Canada, and Canada is very much an oligopoly. Airfares are, uh, you know, not cheap, and the company started this crisis with five billion dollars in cash on hand. So that's not even including potential additional credit. And I think uh, they just dis disclosed in March they actually even had a higher position in March than they had at the end of the year. Um, but you know, if you look at a worst case scenario for Air Canada. Uh, in the second quarter, they're probably burning a billion dollars. So, you know, they start off with five billion. I think they had six or seven billion in March. They're burning a billion a quarter. Um, in a normal, in a normal environment, this is a company whose stock should trade at you know four or five times EBITDA. And so, if you go, you know, fast forward not 2020 but 2021, and you look at what a reasonable, you know, normalized case looks like, you know, obviously. There's a lot of upside in the stock. There's a lot of upside in the bonds. And the question is, do they have the wherewithal to get there? And, and this is a situation in Air Canada where, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We think that the liquidity is very strong. Um, and, you know, the whole airline business in North America is not going out of business. And so, um, you know, we've been, uh, we've been buyers of their equity. We've been buyers of their secured debt. We have a piece of paper at 10% yield that we bought in March, that's two times coverage by covered by collateral. Not even uh, you know, it's not even the airlines. It's covered by real estate and accounts receivable. Two times um, at ten percent yield. So uh, you know, and the company uh, we think is going to get through this okay. But that's the kind of um, you know dislocation opportunity that comes along when you know the issuers. It sounds remarkable. I think I think what what I what I what I enjoy. Uh getting a, a, a good handle on from you, I think what, what's reassuring is that, is that you, you've, you guys have done, you, you know, you've done your homework in terms of the coverage aspect. I think understanding that, that uh, corporate bondholders are, are the first to receive repayment. It's certainly, I mean, what, what, what it sounds like is that, is that the opportunity for investors is to get equity-like returns without the same degree of downside risk, and, and I, I think I think that's where which we'll talk about in a, in, a, in a moment, which is about misconceptions that people have about credit markets or about credit. So those are those are two excellent examples. I think I think again, where where you know, if you were to buy a, a passive passive ETF for high yield or a passive fund for for high yield. You'd really be taking an enormous amount of risk because because you would end up owning a lot of assets that you don't necessarily want to own that you wouldn't want to ever own. You know, from our from our past conversations, you know, I know we've we've talked about the passive versus active, but most people would start to agree that it doesn't make sense to own a passive high yield fund uh, when when you have such clear cut opportunities that are available just from having done your homework. Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, passive is is akin to uh... Uh, you know, if you have a population of, of friends and you're trying to decide how much money to lend them, um, you know, do you ask who's for the most money or do you ask who's got the best job uh, or who's got the most valuable house? That's passive versus active. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, one of the things that's become synonymous with the corporate bond market as far as mainstream media is concerned, is that it seems like there's been a never-ending amount of talk about how corporations have been using corporate debt issuance for corporate buybacks of their own stock. And so with this break in the market that we've had this year, is that the end of corporate buybacks? Uh, you know, the, the the issuance we've seen so far uh, in, through the crisis has been about liquidity. And, and I think that that is... Uh, is Reason number one to borrow for corporations to borrow money right now is just make sure that they have a runway to get through this crisis. Um, 
what I will say is that interest rates are low. So when things return to normal, I mean, we're going to be in a different world because when things return to normal and companies can start pouring money to buy back stock again, then, uh, you know, we're going to be, uh, we're going to have made uh, a lot of money up, up off the bottom. They're, they're also regretting in some cases that, that they didn't do that and that they didn't do that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, right now, um, and we've seen companies, uh, say we're not buying back stock because we need to liquidity. Yeah, I mean, uh, here we are talking about what the opportunities are, but in reality, if you were, if you were in, if you were in credit, um, you're still licking your wounds too, right? I mean, if you're, if you're any, if you had any substantial holdings, um, I mean, I'm sure as a, as a, as a manager, as a portfolio manager, your, your, you know, your existing holdings. I mean, these things happen, right? These dislocations in the market, the corrections in the market happen. So, so it's par for the course to some degree. But, but uh, you know, notwithstanding, of course, I'm sure corporate bond investors are licking their wounds. But at the same time, assuming that that things resume and we get back to normal or some kind of normal, this is a time to be rebalancing. It's a time to be looking at opportunity if you have it. Easier said than done. I mean, that's where you come in, I think, as an active manager. Yeah. And you know what? Everyone uh, who's invested any money over the past years were getting every long position they took because... Uh Everything took a big fat haircut uh, in the month of March. I, I think that, yeah, Pierre, that, that statement you just made, easier said than done, that is so relevant because, um, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I've, I've been in the high-yield debt market since uh, 1996, equities before that. But, um, you know, th- this is a business cycle asset class where uh, you know, equities as well, but there's times in the cycle that are much better for buying non-investment grade corporate debt. And it turns out that the highest returns from this asset class are generated from buying it in the middle of a recession, which is counterintuitive. But if you look at a chart of total returns in the high yield bond market, versus default rates in the high yield bond market. So that's the rate at which companies are actually missing coupon payments and having to file bankruptcy. Um, The most profitable periods for buying high yield corporate debt are when bankruptcies are actually increasing. And the reason why is because when bankruptcies are increasing, it means we're in the middle of the recession and the securities have actually discounted that recession already. So spreads are what? That's the additional return you get from corporate debt over government bonds. Spreads uh, are wide when you're in the recession. And as companies, um, as some of them, and you know, it's it's not going to be 50%. It's going to be, you know, default rates will range from you know kind of one to 2% in good times to seven to 10% in bad times. So as those seven to 10% of companies are missing. Um, there are coupon payments that's actually counterintuitively the best time to invest in this asset class because the market is a very effective discounting mechanism and the market is going from the state we're in today, uh, severe recession to what's going to be normal and we're going to get to a period of normal and you know what, it may take to the fourth quarter, it may take till 2021, but the point is that somewhere in our investment time horizon, things are going to get back to normal and when things get back to normal, the companies will be much stronger credits and so we're kind of in that period. Um, What's interesting is that two weeks ago, uh, a major high yield bond index, the Barclays index crossed a thousand basis points of spread and that means another 10% in yields in the average bond in that index that compares to government bond yields under 1%. And it turns out that um, in the history of the high yield bond market, there's only been three other occasions as crossed a thousand. And if you look at those three occasions, uh, the first two gave you a 12 month total return over 30%. And the last one gave you a 12 month total return over 20%. Um, So it's counterintuitive that you should be going um, increasing your investment level in this asset class in times are horrible because clearly times are horrible right now, but that has been the historical experience. Amazing. It's, uh, it's two, two things. It's ironic to me always that, that in a buyer's market, 
there are few buyers and in a seller's market, there are few sellers. Um, it's exactly the counterintuitive position you're talking about. JP Morgan famously said that a bear market is when the assets return to their rightful owners. And unfortunately, the, the rightful owners are are the wealthy, but there's a lesson to be learned from that, right? I mean, if the 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 best time to buy assets is at the point of maximum pessimism, John Templeton. And and uh, so it makes total sense uh, that that now would be one of those opportune times, easier said than done. Most people don't behave that way at these points in the market because they're scared. And you know, when when banks up bankruptcies are rising, as you said, who's thinking according to our biases? Who's thinking? Oh, bankruptcies are rising. I think I'm going to go buy some some corporate bonds, or I think I'm going to go buy some equities when when we're in the middle of a recession. Uh, that's not most people. That's that's a very you know that's a minority. That's a very small minority of 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 investors that will actually have the discipline, uh, if not properly advised, will have the discipline to do it. Yeah, there there was this investor. Um, he's uh, uh, his name's Warren Buffett. And uh, he said, uh, be greedy when others are fearful. And the converse, right? Fearful when others are greedy. So Sandy, just to cap off the conversation, because it's been a great conversation so far, what is the biggest misconception that investors have about credit markets? Um, as as someone who's, who's worked south of the border and come back to Canada, um, you know, what I find about Canadian investors is that there's very much a barbell approach. People uh, take their portfolio and they'll have a segment that takes almost no risk where they like uh, short-term corporate debt or they like government debt. Um, and then the other half of the portfolio, they'll take a lot of risk. They'll buy equities, they'll buy junior mines, they'll buy, uh, you know, energy, they'll buy Bitcoin. Um, where, uh, you know, the asset class that my group traffics in is in the middle where, you know, historically, if you look at the leveraged finance market, high yield bonds, uh, bank loans, um, they actually return almost as much as the S&P 500, but with a lot less risk. So um, they're in the middle in terms of um, the spectrum. They're not as risky as, as your juniors, but uh, um, they're, you know, obviously you take more risk than being in uh, in money markets, um, and so I, I think the misconception is that uh, it's it's more of a it, this asset class is underappreciated because in an academic sense, if you're trying to maximize return per unit of risk, uh, investors should have a lot of corporate debt. They should have a lot of high yield corporate debt, uh, investment grade. Um, because you know that that is much more efficient, but uh, I feel like the asset class, the asset classes that I traffic in, are probably a little bit underrepresented in Canada on a relative basis relative to Americans. Sandy, I want to thank you very much for your time. It's been a very enlightening chat. We won't wait as long as we did till we do the next one. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.